Gates or a Bill Gates. The success of either company would be hard to envision without the genius of a single man. Take away Hernán Cortés, and for all their gunpowder and Spanish steel, the conquistadors would probably not have defeated the Aztecs when they did. The American Third Army's summer sprint across France seems unlikely without George Patton as its commander. The war in Europe might have been won without Patton at the head of the Third Army, but in a manner that would have been far more costly and lengthy. France had sufficient armor, artillery, and manpower to stop the German offensive through the Ardennes in May 1940. What the reeling French military tragically lacked was any sort of inspired or skilled leadership to translate its advantages into salvation. In other words, a George Patton, Erwin Rommel, or Charles de Gaulle in charge of ground forces. Any other German general other than Rommel would probably never have reached El Alamein. British generals other than Montgomery in late 1942 would probably never have pushed him back so decisively. Had a gift in American General Creighton Abrams commanded much earlier in Vietnam in 1965, and had an equally talented North Vietnamese General Jup never commanded communist forces at all, the war, despite its myriad political, moral, cultural, and technological contours, might have turned out quite differently. For those historians who appreciate human agency, it is common to attribute such overarching powers of military leadership to history's great captains of the battlefield. The genius of an Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, or Napoleon Bonaparte could decide the fate of thousands of soldiers on both sides of the battle line. Pity the Persian who lined up opposite Alexander's outnumbered troops at Gogamila, or the Gaul who was besieged by Caesar at Alesia. Had the former just faced a Parmenio, or the latter a Pompey or Crassus, the overwhelming numbers of his kindred by his side might have saved him. Sometimes we grant such importance of command to sober and judicious organizers, Marcus Agrippa, Dwight D. Eisenhower, John J. Pershing, Alfred von Schlieffen, and Isoroko Yamamoto so mastered the planning of war and the mustering of forces at the general staff level that their insight and knowledge seemed to predetermine the course of upcoming battle. Even brilliant military bureaucrats at home such as George Marshall or Samuel Pepys on occasion ensured that forces at the distant front were likely to win battles before they started. An industry of military history also exists to chart how and why some generals proved great and most mediocre. Usually, singular imagination, daring, charisma, speaking ability, instinct, calm, learning, physical robustness, relative youth, and an organizational mind are cited as the common gifts that, from Alexander to Napoleon, ensure success. Books on the untold secrets of the great generals appear each year, as do their antitheses, the aggregate lessons for modern leaders to be gleaned from the military disasters, errors, and follies of abject incompetence. We assume that there is an identifiable profile of both successful and disastrous military leadership across time and space, and such patterns can be studied, copied, and perhaps put to good use by those less naturally talented, from education to business. Rarely, however, do we hear about saved rather than won or lost wars, or generals who in extremis rescued rather than started and finished a war. Perhaps we neglect saviors who rescue unwise interventions better written off as over and quickly forgotten, or we feel that they are mere relief pitchers of sorts who can only preserve but not claim credit for the eventual successful efforts begun by their worn-out predecessors. Yet often the best generals do not plan wars or assume control on the eve of the first battle, when instead the better-connected marshals of the peacetime bureaucracy exercise high-profile command. Instead, the savior generals prove to be a subset of history's great captains. Such men emerge far later from the lower echelons when wars are almost lost. They arise only because their superiors are desperate and turn to the unlikely, to whom, in normal circumstances, they otherwise probably would not. These eleventh-hour landscapes of battle, when most at home and officers in the field have given up on a war as irrevocably stalemated or lost, draw in a different sort of commander. Pre-war education, reputation, influence, and rank matter little when the enemy is gaining ground and very few.